people are keep coming. I will just start. So, um, welcome everyone. My name is Ethem Özdemirci and I'm the business development manager of Recoded, a non-profit tech organization preparing talented youth in conflict affected areas to enter the digital economy as software developers and tech entrepreneurs. Today, we are doing the final session of a series with founders, creators, investors of technology companies in Turkey, where we get to learn the stories behind how they build their businesses, their products. We will also hear from them about how businesses can adapt quickly during COVID-19 and what opportunities they believe will spring from the crisis. Before we start, a quick round of ground rules for this session. The conversation between Eran and I will take about 30 minutes. Please use the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen to leave comments or ask questions. You can do that now or at any time during the session. Our, time, our team will be selecting some of your questions, which I will ask the speaker in the last 30 minutes of our session. Your microphones will remain muted during the session, but feel free to put your cameras on if you wish. It's always nice to see your faces, your reactions, so it feels more uh, real time. And please also note that this session is being recorded. So we are able to do this speaker session because of a partnership between our team at Recoded Techstars, the GIZ PEP program, Promotion of Economic Prospects in Turkey, and Impact Hub Istanbul. We are teaming up to provide opportunities for youth across Turkey to enter the digital economy through tech and career prep training. Now, back to today's speaker. Eran is former head of product at Parachute, which is a leading cloud-based book, bookkeeping solution in Turkey and the largest SaaS solution in the SME segment with 20K subscribers. In summer of 2019, Parachute was acquired by DST Group. Eran is also the host of Üretim Bande, which is a great podcast about how best tech companies develop their products and they invite a company every week and try to understand their product management process in this podcast. Unfortunately, it is in Turkish for now. Uh, and he previously worked at Evim.net, Gamoba, and Endeavor. So, Eran, it's a great pleasure to have you here as a speaker in this session. Um, I really feel honored to have you here because as... Um, as I was listening to, to your podcast and I knew Parachute was a big success and I know that uh, you played an important role in that startup as well. So I feel really uh, gratitude and honored to have you here. Welcome again. Thank you for having me. The honor is all mine. Uh, I think what you guys are doing at Recorded is um, it's a great vision and your cause is very, very valid. Uh, so again, the honor is all mine and thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Aaron. So, so would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself? Sure. So, um, I studied in Boston University, uh, Boston University. I studied quantitative economics. Um, I also had a minor in entrepreneurship. And that's where I caught the entrepreneurial bug. Um, and in 2009, when I came back to Turkey, I started working at Endeavor. Uh, Endeavor is a global nonprofit that supports high impact entrepreneurs in emerging markets. Uh, and the goal is basically to promote uh, entrepreneurship and create economic value and social value within emerging markets. Um, after that, I had uh, experiences at two different e-commerce companies. Uh, unfortunately, both of them failed, uh, but it was very good um, experience. Um, after which I came to Parachute and worked there for five years until last week. Um, so it, Parachute is, like you said, is the leading SaaS company in Turkey. Uh, it's focusing on providing bookkeeping solutions, online bookkeeping, so bookkeeping solutions to uh, SMEs, Turkish SMEs. And we had a pretty good ride. Uh, it was a pretty good journey. We started with, you know, uh, basically zero SMEs to now 20,000 SMEs. And I joined the company around 300 
uh, customers and left around 20,000. So I was able to see quite a, you know, um, interesting journey from pretty much the start to, uh, to, to till the exit and after the exit as well. Uh, and now I'm focusing on my different projects. Uh, one of the, one of the, one of the big ones, as you mentioned, is the podcast. The podcast is also, um, non-profit, let's say it's, a the, the vision and the motivation to do that is, uh, really to share the, uh, the know-how and best, best practices in the ecosystem with everyone else. Unfortunately, right now it's only in Turkish, but I do have, um, you know, the vision, I have to have the vision to take it global and, you know, perhaps do some content in English as well. And that's it for me. Yeah, that sounds amazing. I'm looking forward to, I think it could be very beneficial for English speaking community as well. So I don't know if it, does it make sense to have both Turkish and English on that? I don't know. We can discuss further maybe when we have uh, time left in the end, sure. but I think it's definitely useful. Um, on the other hand, I was also like, um, kind of uh, watching the parachute story from outside. It was even um, very exciting for me as an entrepreneur who was watching parachute. So th there must be really very good stories there and very good learnings uh, there, I guess, from as a, as a head of product there. It must be fantastic to. to yeah, I mean, I was I was I was lucky that I was part of that journey because I learned a lot. I worked with great people. Um, one of them is actually here. Uh, hi, Emre. Um, so um, we've, you know, we've we've gone through a lot and we've learned a lot from each other. Um, so it was a pretty good journey. I was lucky. Yeah, that's that's very nice. So. Um, could you tell us more about how did you find out your passion about uh, products, digital products in general and product management? Sure. So, uh, like I said, I, I met the entrepreneurial ecosystem back in college. So back in 2008, um, in us in Boston and Boston scene was a bit different than the software scene. It's more like biotech. Uh, mm -hmm. but I was, um, I got introduced to that ecosystem while I was there. And when I came back, that basically just, you know, increased as I worked at Endeavor because all I was seeing was successful entrepreneurs in, in Turkey. Um, although it wasn't really like all software, it's as, you know, as years went by, it became more and more software companies. Um, and I was looking at basically in my career path and I saw that, uh, software is going to be uh, very, very important. So I wanted to go that way, even though I didn't have any experience in software or building or software, you know, uh, development side of things. Um, so I, I chose the direction that, uh, that way, but um, I basically stumbled upon the, the title of product manager by chance because uh, one of the uh, investors of Evimnet who introduced me to the company basically said, so there are two positions open. One is business development, one is product manager. Uh, which one do you want? And as I explored the, the titles, product manager seemed more interesting to me uh, because it was inside the, you know, the building, inside, it was inside the kitchen, basically. Um, so I, um, I chose the product management title there. And so that was like eight years ago. And since then, I've been a product manager. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So I assume that it was a little bit um, hard start for you as you didn't have any technical background, but this might be a kind of a, um, I'm assuming things. So I guess as I have the general knowledge about product management, as companies go through different stages during their life, life cycles, they need different kind of approaches to things. So what was the situation when you started first? So how did you learn product management in general? Where did you start? And could you tell us more about these uh, different product management strategies during these different stages in the company, like when they're startup, when they're scale up, 
and so on. Sure. Could you tell us more about this? Sure. Um, so let me just clarify. You, you don't need to be a technical person to be a product manager. It mm -hmm. helps because, you know, really, uh, you really understand how the machine is working, but you don't need a degree to understand that you basically what you need is um, endless curiosity. Uh, because when you talk to people and you, when you ask them questions, uh, most people explain um, everything. So I, for the first few years, I basically asked a lot of questions to our CTO, to our senior developers, and very stupid questions in their, in their, in their eyes. But um, I was curious. I wanted to learn how it works. Um, so that's, that was a pretty good um, way of getting to know how technology works. I'm still not, you know, um, at least in my eyes, I'm still not enough uh, in terms of the, from from a technical standpoint. I want to, you know, improve myself there. But um, PMs have different backgrounds. Some have technical backgrounds. Some have um, business backgrounds. Some have uh, design backgrounds. I came from more from the business side, and I had experience of, you know, uh, running companies and building companies and. Uh, dealing with investors and all that. So I, I brought that to the table. Um, but to your question, different companies and different stages do require different product management skills and um, uh, processes. So if we break it down, the first part, the, the first part of the custom a company's life is let's define it as pre and product market fit. So you're basically trying to figure out what you're trying to do, you're trying to figure out what the company does, how the product solves the problem, what problem you're solving, how, how are you going to make money, etc. cetera. Um, during that stage, product management, um, as I've seen from you know, other examples and our example as well, you don't need to hire a PM for that. You don't need to um, create another department from that, for that. Uh, it's actually better that the founders do it. Um, the founders should be the first PMs of the company uh, because they know the idea, they know the people, they know the market, they should go to the market themselves. Um, and since there, are, there aren't a lot of people in the company, it's better to keep the distance between the customer and uh, the builders, so the, the software developers and the designers, as short as possible. So we don't wanna put in a different layer of management in between uh, because it's, it wouldn't be beneficial, just quite, quite, quite the contrary, it would probably do harm. Uh, but once you've passed through the pre-product market fit and you've become, you've figured out what the product does, at least to a certain extent, and companies are buying your, uh, or customers are buying your uh, products, then you can start um, implementing a product manager role into the company. And the reason why you do that is the founders now have to deal with different departments. They have to deal with marketing, sales, operations, uh, whatever you have. And they don't spend that much time with product anymore because there are many, many more people and many customers to deal with. Um, so they have to delegate that role to uh, a dedicated person. And now there are more things that you're working on at the same time in terms of development. So it requires a full-time uh, capacity from the company's perspective. Uh, but the challenge there is um, the first PM that you hire need to have um, as much curiosity or energy as the founder towards the problem that you're working on. Because when you think about it, the problem, the, the, the founder has been thinking about that problem for a long, long time. Um, so he knows or he or she knows the, the problem in and out. Um, just giving that knowledge to, or delegating that knowledge to someone, uh, is not going to be that easy. So that person would need to be a self-starter, a curious person, a person who loves to learn new things, um, and who's not afraid of taking ris risky moves or uh, doing risky moves or taking initiatives. Um, and my trick there is the, the founder should give maybe a small portion of the company or the product to the PM first, test it out. If it works out, then give more. If it works out, give more, give more. And then if, you, if that person just grows with the company, then that person can become uh, not just a PM, but you know, a person that can uh, lead PMs as well. 
Um, but once you once you're growing really fast and your team is now bigger and bigger and you're at the uh, growth stage, then you might need more than one PM. Um, and that's going to depend on the product that you're working on, uh, the company that you're building and the scale of the company or the team size, etc. cetera. Um, then you go into the organizational structural issues. Like how do you structure the organization that uh, you don't create unnecessary load or you don't uh, lose the innovation that you had in the first days or you don't lose the customer voice um, or the, the distance is still short between the customer and the builders um, so you know as you get onto the growth stage you also get get requests from your internal customers which is your teammates so then you have to work on for example pricing you have to work on uh, the tools that the internal customers or teams uh, need. So you don't only work on the product itself, but you're working on the, 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 the complementary things around the, the product. Um, so the definition of PM changes in time. And at the last stage, the scale stage, really it's now a massive team. You have hundreds of people working in the company. And then the product management role is basically uh, to find growth areas to keep the existing, like the mothership, the, the main business um, still profitable and growing at a decent rate and finding new areas of growth um, and diminishing complexity. That's, that's gonna be your challenge at the scale stage because with hundreds of people, maybe thousands of people, you are going to have complexity and the, maybe the, the, the number one thing that you would need to do is strive for diminishing that complexity making the complexity like reducing complexity uh so that's pretty much the the main areas of different company scales by the way i mean it all depends on the your industry your sector the the, the size of your company like you might be at a scale stage but you might still be 10 people like mm-hmm. um i don't know like what's up was when it was acquired by facebook so it really depends on your product. If, if it's a very, very technical product, then you need a more technical uh, PM. If it's a marketplace, then you need more of a commercial PM kind of a thing. So it all, always depends on, there is no like one single universal definition of a product manager or product management. Uh, it depends on um, the company and the product and the customer and the market. Thank you, Aran. Uh, great, great answer. As far as I understood, like the for the beginning part of the from the conversation, it seems like to me an entrepreneur or ex entrepreneur or someone who built his own business, something like that, is an ideal background to become a product manager. Is that right? To like because you said like that person has to be curious as the founder and would like try to be come more familiar with the problem and go deeper. This is the first part. Is it correct? And the second part you talk about, about the complexity in the scaling phase. What kind of complexities are we talking about here? Could you just give us a little bit more hint there? Sure. I mean, uh, to answer your first question, my um, bias is towards people who have some sort of entrepreneurial experience. It doesn't need to be like that they started their own company and they built a business. They need to show some sort of entrepreneurial uh, desire that can be like a school project that could be like a side project that they're working on um, hobbies and whatever. Um, but in, you need to have some sort of, um, uh, you know, initiative taking uh, DNA uh, because it is a uh, very, uncertain role. Uh, as for the complexity question, um, it's very basic actually. Like, um, I mean, the problem itself is basic in the sense that as you have more people and you have more layers of organization, it's going to be more difficult to make decisions, make the right decisions. Um, you're going to put, as you get more people inside the company, you're going to be putting more layers in between the customer who has the problem and the people who are building the solution, the software developers and the designers and the PMs, um, that's going to be the main source of complexity. Like your main goal 
as a product manager and as a product builder is to build the right solution for the right problem. And if you do not, if you do not have um, clear data or clear input from the market as, you know, as clear as they are speaking to you, then it's going to be difficult for you to get to that right problem, right solution match. So that's the main complexity. I mean, you, you've probably all seen that diagram of like, if you have uh, two people, you have only two, you know, one connection. If you have three people, you have whatever, six yeah, or yeah. whatever. I, I forgot the thing. And if it's like hundreds of thousands of people, then it's like tens of thousands of connections. So um, even though it's cliche, it's true. It's just that much complexity in there. Yeah, it's a little bit even hard for me to like think of a huge organization and to make decisions there. So I can feel how it could be complex to make a decision on a on a software product with customers, with internal customers, stakeholders. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a kind of a tough thing. So I would like to ask about more of a how. Uh, our KPIs and OKRs are being used during the product management and how it's changing during this, this different stages of companies? Sure. Um, I mean, at the very first stage, at the pre-product market fit, you don't really need metrics or OKRs or KPIs. Uh, you need a soft validation from the customer that it is working, it is solving their problem. Um, and, uh, if there's going to be one, it's so, uh, you really, uh, KPIs at the beginning. Um, but as the company goes, becomes bigger and bigger, uh, um, it's, you're going to have. KPI, my, um, my, yeah, with whatever business model that you have, whether it's SaaS or marketplace or uh, media or whatever it is, on the internet, just look at those KPIs and then try to customize it for your needs. Um, don't try to reinvent the wheel from the start. Just use the metrics that people are using a uh, business model. Um, for SaaS, for example, it's mostly, uh, it's you know, expansion. For marketplace, it's usually, it's, it's probably and side metrics. So find whatever business model metrics, uh, whatever metrics your business model has, apply them and then customize it to your need. Okay. Yeah. They make that make a lot of sense. Thank you. Aaron. So another another question of mine is that product management is acting like a like the hub of the product, market information, sales, marketing, development, support, finance, a lot of a lot of um, functions of the business. So it's kind of a like hub. So could mm -hmm. you explain us more why and how product management is at the intersection of technology and business and how it's operating in a little bit more depth? Sure. Um, to explain it, I, I wanna talk about the, the history of product management, basically. The, the original source of product management actually came from the FMCG market. So the, the Procter and Gamble's and Unilever's uh, product managers there were under the marketing department. Um, and the, the purpose for that position for that function was to um, give someone the responsibility of the, the PNL, so the profit and loss of a business unit or a brand. So somebody was responsible for, uh, Elidor shampoo brand or head and shoulder shampoo brand. So that was the reason why um, this role occurred. They needed someone to coordinate every effort, whether that's finance, marketing, production, whatever, uh, to get the product out into the market. And they would be responsible for being in the market and deciding on 
things to promote sales. Um, and so at that time at the FMCG market, marketing department was the closest to the customer. Um, so that's why product management was under marketing. But then as we came to, we, as we come to software and technology and as cloud computing comes and uh, as it's easier for you to ship and build things and ship it to product to, to users easily, um, and it's easier for you to get in touch with the customer. It became closer, the, the product management role became closer to the technology department. And it's actually, it, it's, it's its own department now, but it's closer to the product, uh, the product building department, which is the technology department. Because uh, like I said, the distance between the builders and the users should be extremely short. So uh, PMs are responsible for being in touch with the customers and they are in the product, so the technology um, side of the business. So they can immediately translate whatever they're hearing from the customer to the builders. Also PMs have both a business acumen, back acumen and a technical acumen. So they can speak both the languages. Um, they don't necessarily have to be fluent in both languages, but they need to be able to understand both sides so a pm should be able to understand why sales is re requesting a certain feature or they should be on they should be able to understand why a developer is saying is that you know it's going to take longer than that or they're going to have to work on this infrastructural uh requirement so it's it's both a translator uh, a bridge i also say that pms are more like lobbyists that they have they would have to get things done so they would have to rally the people around them and they not in a bad way but you know in order to um fi figure out the incentives of the people like why are they motivated to do something and get it out the door uh so yeah so that's why it's like somewhere in between all the uh, uh departments yeah i got it clearly and while you're speaking actually i i'm understanding that I've somehow uh, played like product manager role or roles regarding product when I was uh, doing sales development or sales, let's say. So I was kind of trying to translate. So I'm understanding much better now what product management is really. So another thing is that I want to learn uh, is Pricing, as we know, is very important, of course, about the product for the market and so on from a lot of uh, points. But what, 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 is, what does pricing mean to product uh, management? Uh, how we should, uh, what product management think about pricing? Sure, so I'm gonna explain this from the, the SaaS point of view, from the software as a service point of view, but because that's mm -hmm. what I'm most familiar with. Um, so I, I'm, I mean, I'm gonna confess, I didn't value pricing as much I do now before in my early days. Mm -hmm. I just thought that it was just a number that you put mm -hmm. on. It's, it's basically a label on top of the product, um, but it's much more than that. It's actually a competitive advantage of a company if you're able to sell your product even though you're more expensive then it's an incredible competitive advantage for you why because with the money that you get uh with the more money that you get compared to your competitors you can actually take that money and invest back into the company and get more customers or make your product better and improve your team and et cetera. So it's, it's a vicious cycle actually of competitive advantage. If you price it high and you, if you can sell it well, so you don't lose customers if you like increase your prices, then it's an amazing position to be in. It's very, very, it's difficult to get to, uh, but when you get there, it makes the company much more valuable. It makes the position of the company much more valuable uh, because you make more money. Uh, I mean, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna simplify it, but compare your um, um, 
if you compare your ex expenses to your competitor, let's assume that you have similar expenses, if not like, you know, uh, less. Um, if you're charging more and if you're getting more money from the customer for the same expense, that means that you have more money in the bank that you can invest into the, into the company. And that means that your competitor ha will have less of an arsenal to deal with you, to compete with you. And pricing, I thought was, like I said, it was just a number on a stick, but on a sticker, but uh, it's, it's actually a science. It's a art and a science or, or, or on its own. And you need to do several iterations to figure out the best way to price your product. Uh, by the way, they do pricing studies on even restaurants. Like they provide you with a menu and they provide me with a different menu. Same products, different prices, and they test out the, uh, the pricing. If, for example, sales number, sales number doesn't change for a burger that you're selling and I'm paying like $2 more, then why would I not charge it, charge it? Two dollars more. It's not about capitalistic, you know, making money kind of a thing, but it's about you know, getting more cash inside the business so that your position position of the company can be stronger in the market and you can reinvest in, into the company. It's kind of like to understand what the perceived value for the customer, right? Like from the experiment you um, you told. Yeah. By the way, I mean. Like I said, this is, I'm talking about uh, software as a service because yeah. what Amazon is doing, for example, uh, what they're saying is uh, like your margin is my uh, competitive advantage. What was, it? what was it saying? Your, your margin is my yeah, competitive advantage. Basically saying like if you sell this notebook uh, for a higher price on the competitor of an Amazon, Amazon is going to make it cheaper and get the customer from you so this e-commerce will have a different dynamic so i'm only talking about uh software products that you sell enterprise solutions uh SaaS solutions that you sell to customers but in any case for pricing you need to figure out uh your own model and you need to test it out yeah well, Lots of times. very practical very simple question i think it might sound even dumb a little bit but let's assume that I have a, a software product which I think useful, has a market. I've talked to my friends, some people, I've tested the waters and I think it's, it's valid. Mm -hmm. But I haven't checked the pricing with them and I don't think that they are the real customer yet. But I, I'm considering to create a beta version of this product and understand where the pricing could be and i don't have any competitors let's say i don't have any market price what is mm -hmm. the best or practical first step to understand pricing in this point for example yeah, i mean it's very basic just put on a price and try to sell uh start from the high and then go down if uh you, you you're trying to sell you're trying to sell and you just cannot sell and there's no problem in the product then lower the price and then you'll find a sweet spot somewhere. Uh, but you know, start from the high and then go down because even though it's, it's very counterintuitive, you would say that, okay, I'll just charge cheap because I just need a customer. Um, but customers are actually out there. You just need to find them. Um, so from the, from the beginning, you can start high and then go down low because if, if it's really, meaningful for the customer they will give you some sort of a signal in terms of pricing their optimum pricing um, and that actually tests how valuable your product is if it's not that valuable um, they're not gonna you know fight or you know make you know they're not gonna negotiate with you that much mm -hmm. yeah that makes total sense thank you Ara. so i have other questions but for the time being i would like to jump on to our guest questions. So Mohammed is, is asking, how did you structure the product development, especially the development cycles? Did you use basic methods like Scrum, a scale, or is it too basic? So what have you been yeah. using, using 
there. At so, so we started with waterfall and then we mm. moved on to um, Scrum uh, pretty quickly. Um, but then we started um, basically customizing Scrum to our needs. Um, I, I can't say that we implemented Scrum, you know, uh, word by word or 100%. Uh, some things we were good at, some things we lacked and we couldn't really do from the Scrum point of view. Um, but one thing that I would say um, that our teams did a great job in the last two years was that um, actually one tool that you need, you need is uh, retrospectives. Um, that part of Scrum is extremely important because it has a flywheel effect in, in the sense that um, if you keep doing them every single sprint or every single week or whatever your frequency of sprints are, um, you're going to come to a place where it's your own way of doing things, but it works with you and you're actually shipping faster and you're shipping better. Um, so it doesn't matter where you start as long as you're doing retrospectives every single you know, sprint. Um, you might end up at 100% scrum or you might end up at 0% scrum. It doesn't matter. Just iterate on, your, on how you work because that's how you work is um, almost as if not more important than what you're working on or um, yeah, what you're working on. So uh, just do as many iterations as possible to figure out the best one for you. Uh, I would like to ask a question to each my own, own problem actually. So just to understand your perspective, uh, we are doing sprints, weekly sprints for BizDev. It's not like Scrum, but it's like, as you said, something customized to our needs. But, and we are doing weekly uh, retrospectives. Do you think any, any um, time period is ideal for this kind of sprints? Or do you prefer like be weekly over one week or longer sprints do you have any specific experience of course it depends on uh, multiple things yeah. but do you have a kind of a general tendency or lessons learned there we came to the uh, conclusion of two week sprints because one week wasn't uh, long enough to create something meaningful and mm -hmm. anything longer than two weeks was too much too long um, mm -hmm. two weeks is manageable like you can like you can talk about next week and you know, for example, what meetings that you have next week. Uh, but two weeks from now is going to be too further away. And one week, one week is, uh, one week is going to be um, not enough to create something meaningful. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, that makes sense. That totally makes sense. So... Uh, Mohammed is asking again, as 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 a PM, do you solely manage one product or service, or can the CEO or other people from management also request help in new ventures for the business, such as new products or completely different domains, that sort of thing? Um, so this is difficult to answer because if you're the only PM in the company, and if the state of the business that you're in is changing rapidly, you might need to work on different products at the same time. In an ideal world, um, every PM would be responsible for one area or product or domain because then it creates focus and it's more effective that way. However, in reality, that's, rarely the case you always get you know bombarded with uh different kinds of issues from all around the company and you have to switch context all the time unfortunately that's one of the toughest things about being a product manager that you have to switch between contexts and you have to switch uh, from very high level issues to very low level issues at, uh, very quickly um so in an ideal world yes a pm should focus on one area but in reality most companies uh, don't have the luxury to do that but to be honest um, as you 
become you know a more experienced PM, you you do a better job of managing those um, context switches. Um, but obviously, everybody has you know a limit to themselves. Thank you. So Mohammed is asking another question, which is a little bit more practical to the point. And he says that their price is 10 times less than any competitor globally and locally at the minimum level. And that's their competitive advantage, actually. And, and by they want to keep it, kept it, keep it low. Mm-hmm. Do you think pushing the price up will be better for them? And he's providing also a little bit context here that they are thinking about it because they don't want to come seem like a cheap service or product although it doesn't uh, cost them much like they can make profit like $390 per $10 they spent which sounds fantastic but what do you think about their pricing points in so um, one of the, the most famous venture capitalists in Silicon Valley Anderson Horowitz partner Mark Andreessen was saying, if I could just put on a billboard in uh, Silicon Valley, if I could just do that, I would love to do it. Uh, he was saying he was going to buy ad spaces all around Silicon Valley and just write, increase your prices on that billboard. Um, the reason why he was saying, and the, the experience that we had at Parachute was the same, actually. I w- to be honest, I was very um, timid about. Um, increasing the prices i thought we were gonna for some reason offend the customers or you know uh, lose customers or churn customers um but that didn't happen at all we increased the prices three times um three or four i'm not really sure three definitely maybe four um three times and we didn't really see a huge increase in churn um so that means we just increased our revenue. Uh, we didn't lose many customers and we have the same expenses. Um, amazing. You know, it's, I mean, $10 to $390 profit is also amazing, but why not 500? You know, if, if there is room for that, by the way, I mean, I cannot tell you uh, that there is like, you can, all, you can only go up to 500 or something like that. Market's going to give you that. Um, signal and there's only one way to do it uh, you can just test it out um, by the way there is going to come to a point there is there is a ceiling and the ceiling doesn't necessarily have to be your competitor's price it can be lower or it can be higher as well and that's going to be uh, showing you the value that the market is giving you in comparison to the other products in the market your position in the market basically um and just test it out try try the limit um there is such a thing as like pushing it too far like if you charge a lot of money for a product that you don't really um value that much then people are going to complain people are going to churn you are going to see it in your in in your numbers but as long as you don't like increase the prices by a thousand times i don't think you're going to see that right away Uh, if you increase your prices um gradually then the transition should be uh easier by the way there are different pricing models pricing you can change your pricing model uh seem like you're actually charging less but get more revenue from uh the customer in time so that's an interesting uh structure as well so pricing like i said it's a science there are different pricing models that you should try um but you know try it increase your prices increase your revenue per customer let's say um so that you have more money in the uh, war chest would you have any specific advice for resources for pricing like a book or uh, someone to follow just specific for the pricing um so there is for SaaS, there's a book called predictable revenue uh mm-hmm. that um talks about pricing but also the sales part of the business as well um mm-hmm. there's also um 
I think it's called Profit Well. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a blog about um, SaaS pricing again. Again, this is SaaS, um, mm -hmm. software as a service. Um, mm -hmm. They do a lot of analysis in the market. They share quite useful content. Uh, I like some of their frameworks. It uh, opened up some of my thinking uh, towards pricing there. Thank you very much. So it's not predictable revenue and profit well. Yes. Thank you very much, Aaron. So I'd like to jump a little bit to um, entrepreneurship side of things and your advices about it. As you know, it's generally entrepreneurship is, is very hard, but nowadays with COVID-19, I think it became even more harder. So what do you think current founders should be focusing on in these times? Is it product? Is it strategy? More resilience? What would be your general advice for the founders? Sure. Um, I mean, I'm not, so I, it wouldn't be right for me to give like, you know, founder, founder experience or ad, advice. Uh, I can only give uh, from my experience, which is um, basically my experience. I didn't like found parachute. Um, but one thing that I think is uh, clear from the product management side as well is just focus on the customer. Um, like really be honest with yourself in terms of are we solving their problems? Are we creating real value? Are the customers really happy with using our product or uh, are they going to go to a competitor you know, whenever there is a new one? So we really need to be uh, extremely honest with ourselves during, uh, for that uh, topic. Just do not uh, increase the distance between the customer and the builders, um, especially now when there is the lack of market or um, lack of liquidity in the, in the market. So it's um, on trends. And by the way, it doesn't mean that Customer wants feature X, build it. Customer wants feature Y, build it. I mean, like, really spend time with the customer, understand them, understand their context, understand the job, um, and create the best product for them. Yeah, thank you. That that makes total sense to closer to customer in hard times. Ahmed is asking, like, how should we price um, an open source product for implementation or for customization, how, how someone can make the calculation there? Sure. Um, so I have limited experience with open source products, but um, basically the main want people to, uh, when you want, or the product, use the SaaS product where you pay for it, but uh, on top of that, uh, uh, modularization of the product. Uh, mm. so, uh, of the product, uh, but one day for all SaaS businesses uh, models is um, try to get model so if there are small companies in your market then figure out the best pricing model for the small companies if there are large companies with certain segments for example retail like or uh, you know large companies with you know lots of cash I don't know I'm just making it up uh, then okay. segment the pricing model towards it so rather than focusing on the the pricing tactics uh, try to analyze the market in a way that you slice the market and then figure out pricing models, different pricing models for each slice of the market. So you might be offering uh, a usage-based pricing for the, the higher, the large companies, but you might be offering a module-based pricing for the low-end customers. So it doesn't have to be a, a universal, a one standard pricing model for the entire segment of the market. 
that make that makes a lot of sense thank you Aaron. and ahmed is asking like uh do you have any advice to stop building software for others and focus on building your system and then sell it to users specifically as like uh this sales did so i think ahmed is asking like when you should yeah. stop building yeah. custom software solutions and then you go sure. for like sales and so on um i mean obviously there is no like you know um but generally there is generally there is one core or area of product that people are going to post like one core area will be the um the most important part of their product and the others will be uh, supplementary or complementary features towards that so if you think that you figure that core part out uh just separate that out and offer it as a separate product without the supplementary and the complementary things if you can sell that if people are buying that then i think you're ready to do or jump to uh, a separate independent SaaS product at least there is enough material to um to try it out in real world thanks Aaron. i will be getting the last um question and mohammed is asking when creating a profitable web service let's say what are the non-technical things uh one should be aware of um the the importance of distribution uh, and by distribution, I mean uh, sales, marketing, or however you are um, getting your products at the end, at, to the hands of the users. So how are you selling? How are you marketing the product? What channels are you using? What models are you using? As product people, we are um, usually, uh, we're more focused on the product itself rather than the selling and the marketing of the product. And it's usually a second um, thing for us to think about. However, that part is also extremely important because as they say, you know, build it and they will come. That's usually not the case. That's rarely the case. If you have such a product, amazing. Uh, but usually you have to go and sell it to them. And um, you have to think about the distribution model from very early on. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to implement the entire team right now or build the you know, marketing budget for the build the marketing machine to promote your brand or your product. It just means that you have to think about, okay, what kind of a model would work for my business? How can I get my product to my customers? Do I have to do a field sales? Do I have to do a uh, phone sales? Uh, do, I, do I have to do like offline event marketing or do I have to do a channel sales? Like, do I, do I need partners uh, to, to sell my product? So figuring out what the distribution model is going to be is also extremely important because pr there is a competitive advantage in the product, but there's also a competitive advantage in the distribution. If you own distribution, then pr your profitability is going to go up and your market reach is going to go up. Because as, when you think about it, if you're promoting and if you're selling only from, you know, Google ads and Facebook ads, you're, you're bidding for the same words as anyone else in the market. So it's a bidding war. The only person who's winning is Google and Facebook on that war. You and your competitor are bidding for the same word. So for the same customer. So you basically money wins cash wins on that um, on that front um, but if you have a distribution channel where it's unique to you or you're very powerful at then it's quite um, difficult to compete with for example um, if you have if you have a very good distribution channel if your product is missing some things you're not going to really see that in your numbers that much because the power of your distribution 
is going to cover that. Um, that doesn't mean that the product should be missing things, but it's just, I'm just trying to show you the, 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 the power of the distribution. For example, on the parachutes uh, example, that unique distribution model is our relationship with the accountants. So if we provide value to accountants, then accountants start selling our products. So if we own that relationship and if they trust us, and if we have a network of thousands and thousands of uh, accountants in our uh, portfolio, then it's very difficult for another company to come into the market because we already have a trusting, loving relationship with, the, with our partner, with our accountant. Um, and because it's based on trust, if we don't lose it, if we don't lose that trust, then it's going to be difficult for a new player to come in. Thank you very much. This was really gold, Aaron. If you have a few minutes more, I would like, I would like to take one more guest question. And then sure. I would like to ask a kind of a short personal question about sure. your podcast. So Mohammed is asking, would you have any advice on how to test a web service which is used by freelancers? This is um, kind of a very general question, but. Not sure what you mean by that, Mohammed, but uh, let me try to explain as I understand it. And if you want, you can uh, ask in and chat. I will be looking at the chat. Um, so it, if it's about like, you know, testing the, the development of the freelancers or so the quality of the freelancers, if it's about that. Um, I would say the way to create a standard for quality would be not on the, the testing side, but actually from the beginning of the pli pipeline, as in if you're providing clear do documentation and if you're explaining yourself well enough, um, then you're actually diminishing potential problems uh, that you're going to see in the test period from, from the start. Obviously the quality of the freelancer is extremely important. If they are a good quality, a senior developer, designer, product manager, whatever, that's going to show in the work. But assuming that there is no problem in the quality, um, what we need to do is provide extremely clear documentation on what we want. Uh, for them to build. Thank you very much, Aaron. And I would like to ask you, as I shared in the introduction, uh, you're also one of the hosts of a podcast called Üretim Bantı, which means production line in Turkish. I personally think that Üretim Bantı is one of the most important um, podcasts in software production, especially as a person coming from business, trying to understand their technical sides but other parts as well i think it was a really useful it is still a useful resource so i am thankful for that that you are doing this with your co-host my question is how how did you start to do this do that and why did you start to do that and how is going what's coming next in that in that uh, sure. series so um, it started as with any other initiative and project and business. It started from my own um, problem set, basically. Uh, so at Parachute, we were having some you know, uh, issues that we wanted to resolve regarding our product development cycle. And I was calling up friends from the industry and asking them, how do you solve this problem? How do you solve that problem? How can you solve this and whatever? And so we were having these discussions with them anyway. And on parallel, I am a, I'm still, and I was a huge podcast listener and I loved podcasts and I still do. And I like, I think they are one of the most amazing sources of uh, information and education. I think they're very, very valuable. Uh, so I was a big fan of the, uh, for, of the podcast industry. So I was, and I, I wanted to do something basically. So I said, why don't we just combine these conversations that we're having uh, with a podcast? And that's how we, you know, uh, that's how it became to reality. So it gave me a reason to meet new people. 
uh, it gave me a reason to hear their experiences and their um, know-how and best practices. It was, it's basically uh, one of my competitive advantages because I'm trying to learn from all these people as well as I'm building stuff and I'm meeting new people and I'm meeting new um, ways of doing things. Uh, so that's personally why I'm doing it. And as for the Uretim uh, Bandi itself, um, what my vision for that is, uh, I think it's going to be a, a hub for um, know-how on product development. Um, I want this to be, at some point, a global hub where um, you can find really valuable and um, real uh, experience and real, you know, best practice and know-how. I think it's most, you know, most of these things are like if you if you tie it with an advertising business model, you're bound to become a BuzzFeed like. Uh, content site where you provide 10 different ways of you know doing the product management uh, and that's going to you know basically push you towards clickbait and um, your know, page view uh, so I'm trying to find a way where I can build this into an, an institute where it's not you know an advert it's not based on advertising uh, revenue but it's you know, financed by some other way where it's more of a university or an institute or an educational um, organization where if you have any questions about building a product, you can, you know, go to whether that's, you know, uh, reading or taking courses or, you know, talking to people or attending conferences and whatever. Um, I envision this place to be uh, high quality, um, know how institute basically sounds fantastic really i like that 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 plan or vision as well and i'm more than happy to support help personally as well uh, okay. if i can do any help uh, sounds very good so i think we are over our time a little bit so i would like to thank you a lot it was very very valuable to have you here and i hope everybody benefited at least as I did. So thank you very much for being here, Aran. Thank you for inviting me again. It was really, uh, it was a great experience and it was great to hear th these questions as well from the audience. Um, it's, it's a perspective that I don't uh, see much. So it was very, very uh, educational for me as well. Thank you very much. So I will be just closing this session very shortly. As you know, this was the uh, the end of our speaker session. So it is a little bit sad today, but also happy that we finished another series of sessions. So thank you all for joining. You can follow us on social media to be informed about recorded news, events, programs. Hope to see you soon. And please fill out the survey that you shared on the chat. It's very important for us to improve our events, our sessions. So hope to see you soon in other events. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye-bye.